Welcome. Today we will be looking at the notes worksheet entitled Combinations. And so this lesson is a follow-up of the permutations lesson that we just looked at. And so we'll do a lot of compare and contrast today, permutations versus combinations. So let's do an investigation to kind of get us thinking about it, and then uh, we'll see how the mathematics bears out here. So there's an investigation at the top that talks about arrangements versus groupings. And so let's go ahead and take a look at part A and uh, see how that, go, and that contrasts with, with letter B. So it says, how many three flavor arrangements, everyone if you don't mind, underline that word for me, arrangements, how many three flavor arrangements in a cone can be made from vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, and mint ice cream? Now just a couple things with this one, it looks like I have a set of four flavors, and I'm going to make a three scoop cone out of the four flavors, and we will, um, for our purposes here, we will assume that you have to choose one of each. So um, you can't do two of the same. No repetition, I guess, is what I'm after here. And so if that is the case, I have four distinct objects, four distinct flavors, and I'm going to arrange three of those four flavors in a cone. And so this looks like a perfect candidate for permutations. So one more time, four um, distinct objects, and I'm going to arrange three of them at a time. So it looks like it's going to be 4P3. And so everyone let's just get a little more practice dealing with the, this situation here. Uh, we did the formula the other day. But uh, here, in this case, I'll just go ahead and get this from the calculator. Let's get 4P3. And 4P3, of course, would be 24. So if I listed all of the um, triple scoop cones from these four flavors, if I listed them all, there should be 24 possibilities, 24 different ways to arrange them. Okay, now everyone, let's do part B. And notice uh, the phrasing is slightly different. It says, how many three flavor groupings? Everyone, if you can underline the word groupings on your paper. So how many three flavor groupings on a dish can be made from vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, and mint ice cream? All right, so we don't have a mathematical way to kind of pull this off, so I'm afraid we're just going to have to draw it out here. So everyone, if you would, let's draw a little dish just on your paper, something like that. And how many three flavor groupings from these four distinct objects, these four flavors, can we make? Well, let's start it out. So how about vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry? Now, if you notice this, in this particular case, when I just have a group of those three, the order in which they're placed in the dish really doesn't matter. It's still literally just a grouping of vanilla and chocolate and strawberry. So um, I wouldn't sort of put them in a different order for some reason and call it a different, way, a different group. It is the same group. And so there we are. There's a grouping of vanilla and chocolate and strawberry. All right, let's come up with a different grouping. So three flavors in a dish. How about vanilla, chocolate, and mint? Something like that. All right, very good. Next one, let's see what we can create here. How about hmm, vanilla, strawberry, and mint? Something like that. All right, just trying to come up with as many as possible. So vanilla, strawberry, and mint seems to be different than these two right here. And then let's see if I can come up with another one. How about chocolate, strawberry, and mint? Something like that should do. That is definitely different than the previous three. And then I would ask you, do you think there are any others? Can you come up with any other three flavor groupings in a dish? No, nah, I think that's it. I think that's all we have. So as a matter of fact, it looks like there are exactly four. All right, perfect. So we had 24 arrangements, but we only had four groupings based on four objects and taking three of them at a time, either arranging them or grouping them. Okay, so I'm hoping everyone sees the difference so far between A and B. Now let's go ahead and see how this all plays out. It says pick one selection of the three flavors. How many ways were there to select those three flavors in part A? How many ways were those uh, how many ways were there to select those three flavors in part B? Okay. Well let's go ahead and do this. Let's kind of just get a little vertical curtain right in there, kind of separate it. And I'm just going to look at part B first, if that's all right with you. And I'm just going to pick the very first one there. 
So vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. Let's just go with those three. Perfect. So there's only one way to pull that off in Part B. That's, there's only one way to group those three flavors. There they are, grouped on the dish. All right. Now, how many different ways can we select those three flavors if we were making cones? Now, I guess the argument can be made that the order does matter when you make that triple scooper. So, for example, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry is one way to make that cone. That's one arrangement of those three flavors. And again, this, if nothing else, it really solidifies the difference between an arrangement and a group. Okay, so this would be one way. So it says how many ways were there to select those three flavors in part A? Well, here's definitely one way to do it. And how about vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate? That would be a different cone, different arrangement of those three flavors. All right, let's go for it. Let's see how many I can come up with here. How about chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry? And maybe how about chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla? Okay, so I have four so far. And let's see, last set, how about strawberry, vanilla, chocolate? And everyone, how about strawberry, chocolate, vanilla? I think that's going to do it. And you can probably see in each case, um, for this three flavor grouping, there are six different arrangements possible. And if I repeated that process for this grouping, and for this grouping, and for this grouping, for each one of these groupings, there are six different arrangements. And you can see that in the, in the answer, four times six is 24. So for each grouping, I would multiply it by six in order to get this. Or conversely, for each permutation, for each six permutations there, I would divide and get that right there. 24 divided by six is four. Okay, so let's go ahead and put a few things together here so you can see just some of the connections. It says the same thing applies to any three flavors in the group. I had alluded to that, of course. So the answer from part A, as arrangements, must be reduced by a factor of six. So for each one of these, there are six of these. So our answer from part A would be reduced by a factor of six to get our answer from part B. And as it turns out, by the way, Six is a factorial number. It happens to be three factorial, as you'll see momentarily. And uh, that's how we get from arrangements to groups. Okay. So if you remember our formula for permutations, the formula for what will be combinations is coming up qu pretty quickly here. All right. Well, let's continue. I think now we really have uh, put a few things together. So first and foremost, when we talk about permutations, we're talking about arrangements. And the, the way you would phrase this is, the order does matter. Vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry is different than vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate. The order does matter. We're in a, in a combination, it's more of a grouping. That's the, the buzzword for combinations. And the order does not matter. When I had vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry in a dish, it didn't matter how it was placed. It is still a grouping of those three flavors. Now, one thing to kind of note with this piece and then uh, we'll continue with this next investigation. Um, remember, no repetition. So if you have a situation where things are going to be repeated, then it is not a candidate for combinations and it is not a candidate for permutations. So I just want to be clear about that piece. No repetition can be allowed. You're uh, taking a set of objects and you're arranging some of them at a time, or are you taking a, starting with a group of objects, distinct objects, and you're grouping them at a time. Okay, well, let's see. Let's do the investigation here and, and then get our notation and formula and do some examples with this. So I think on the previous lesson, we did two-letter permutations of A, B, C, and D. And now let's do two-letter combinations of A, B, C, and D. So let's go for it. So uh, I'm going to just create a list and sort of come up with it um, just visually, and then we'll go ahead and calculate it out and see if it works. So let's see, a, a two-letter grouping. A and B would be a two-letter combination uh, from these four letters right here. So take a look. Four distinct letters, and we're grouping two of them at a time. No repetition is allowed, and it is just a group. So A, B, there it is. 
Um, I would not do BA and call it something different. It's just a grouping of these two letters right here. Well, let's see how many others I can create. How about A and C? How about A and D would be another two-letter grouping? Let's see, I'm going to do B and C. And then how about B and D? And how about C and D? So two-letter groupings from the four letters given right here in this set. And I think that's pretty much all we can create. Again, no repetition. And the order does not matter. So um, it's just a grouping of those two letters right there. B and A is the same as A and B. So it looks like I end up getting six. I'm going to go ahead and put six right here. And then just write one or two things off to the side. And so uh, first and foremost, here's how I would kind of do it with quotes. AB is the same as BA. So we wouldn't count it twice, basically, is the way I would think of that. So AB is the same as BA. All right. Now let's get the, the formula and notation taken care of there. I'll come back to this piece and we'll get it from the calculator momentarily. But we're doing nicely so far. I'm hoping everybody agrees with this. Uh, the investigation worked out pretty well. So again, a set of four distinct letters, and I'm grouping two of those letters at a time. All right, so that will be, when all said and done, 4C2. And that should be equal to 6. Let's go ahead and maybe get that from the calculator first as I'm kind of thinking about it. Then we'll put the notation formula in. So I think you kind of knew this was coming, but here we go. So four letters. I move on over there. There's our NCR. And so we go 4C and 2, and there it is, equals 6. Okay. So here we go, notation. Kind of nice. You already saw it. NCR, everybody. Now what's kind of cool about this is and what the investigation at the top of the page was meant to show you is that it is really just a reflection of the permutations formula. We take the permutations formula and we have to divide it by a certain factor. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do on your paper. Let's write the permutations formula from the previous lesson. If you remember that one, it was n factorial over n minus r factorial. This would be the number of permutations but what we want to do is reduce this by a particular factor to go from arrangements to groups, to go from permutations to combinations. And the way it works, as a matter of fact, is you divide still by r factorial. And so if, I just like making connections here, so if you give me just a sec on this, remember here was um, NPR, so in terms of the three flavors that we took, so we would take 24, and as it says, divide by r factorial, 3 factorial. And 24 divided by 3 factorial is 4. And that's where that came from right there. So I like that piece, really, all coming together beautifully. So it is the permutations formula divided by r factorial. And that's what it would look like. Okay, good. I'll leave the... the well, you know, let's, let's just do that. I was, just want to make the connection to this investigation, and then we'll go ahead and uh, do the calculator piece for the remaining ones. So we already got 4C2, but just wanted to make sure you see where that comes from. So I'm just trying to find a spot for it. So in this case, if I was to do 4C2, this would be 4 factorial over 4 minus 2 factorial divided by 2 factorial. And so you can kind of see this piece. And by the way, yesterday, when we did this on the permutations lesson, this part right here, I believe, gave us 12 permutations. And we would take those 12 permutations and divide by r factorial, divide by 2, as a matter of fact. 2 factorial is 2. So you 12 divided by 2, and that gives us the 6 right here. And so if you want to kind of see this all laid out, I'm going to go ahead and expand it just for my purposes here. You certainly don't have to. But 4 minus 2 factorial would just be 2 times 1, and then again 2 times 1. And so you can kind of see how this is going to play out. These are going to cancel, those are going to cancel, and you get 12 divided by 2. And so it's 6. So, so many different looks at it. Hoping 
certainly all of it kind of clicks. All right, guys, let's go do a set of examples. So example one, how many four element sets can be chosen from a set of 10 objects? So we have 10 distinct objects to start, and I'm going to group four of them at a time. So just kind of the buzzwords that, that go with combinations um, can be chosen, can be selected, can be grouped. It doesn't say anything about arranging them in a particular order. So just sort of the, the phrasing right there leads us to just saying we're starting with 10 objects, and how many different ways can we choose them or group them? It would just be 10 C4. Okay, so let's go ahead and get that from the calculator. Everybody with me, of course. I'm going to bring up the 10 and move it on over there. And so this is what we're looking for right in there. So 10, C, and 4. And so there are 210 different groupings possible, taking 4 out of the 10. All right, now let's get into maybe a little more applicable type problem. So example two. In the game of poker, five cards are drawn from a standard deck of 52. How many different poker hands are possible? So when you get a, a poker hand of, of five cards, they can be any five from a set of 52. And these are 52 distinct cards. There's no repetition in them. And we're going to take five of them. Now think about it when you do have a, a set of cards in your hand. Um, when you're playing poker, it doesn't matter how those cards are placed in your hand. It is still considered the same set of five cards. And so as a result, the order in which they're placed in your hand does not matter. That's the key. And you'll hear me kind of use that phrasing a lot. The order does not matter. And so if the order does not matter, it seems like this is a nice candidate for combinations. So a set of 52 cards and we're going to group five of them in our hand. How many different groupings of five from the set of 52 are possible? And so let's bring this on up. And so in terms of how many different poker hands are possible when you play, I've got that, 52C5 as a result. Oh, and a nice large number on that end. So let's see, I have over 2 million, huh? So 2 million... 598,960. Wonderful. Okay, so combinations. The, the key to this whole unit is really just asking yourself, when is it counting principle? When is it permutations? When is it combinations? And that's the key. That's certainly the hardest part. So let's see if we can uh, talk ourselves through a few more. So example three. To win in the New York State Lottery, one must correctly select six numbers from 59 numbers. The order in which the selection is made does not matter. All right, so right there, guys, sort of given, order does not matter. So right away, you know it's not permutations. And how many different tickets are possible? Um, in this case, I think it's the way the New York State Lottery works. It's 1 through 59, so 59 distinct numbers and you choose six of them, so you'll get six numbers on your ticket, and the way that they are ordered on your card does not matter. So for example, and you know, don't write this on your paper, if you have these six numbers on your uh, ticket, it's the same as this right here. That's the same ticket. So it's just a grouping of six numbers out of the 59. I hope everyone's okay with that piece. If the order did matter, obviously that would up the number of possibilities by quite a bit. But in this case, again, the order does not matter. It's just a grouping of six numbers from the set of 59. All right, well, let's go ahead and bring that up again. Getting the hang of this, hopefully. So 59 numbers. And on your ticket, you get six. So let's see this one. This is 45 million different possibilities in the New York State Lottery. So 45 million, I got 57,474. 59C6. All right. Let's go ahead and do example four now. So it says, a firm must select a group of two men and two women to represent them at a conference, 
If 10 men and 9 women are qualified to pull this off, in how many ways can management make its decision? Ah, now this gets interesting here, everyone. This is a slight change from the previous problems because I have two different things I have to do with this. I have to go ahead and, and figure out how many different ways we can select two men from the group of 10, uh, from the set of 10, let me phrase that correctly for you. And then I also have to figure out how many ways to select two women from the set of nine that are available. Interesting. All right, well, let's start it out here. I think it's kind of one task at a time, if you remember me talking about uh, tasks. So one thing to do and then a second thing to do. So let's start talking about this. How many different ways can we select two men from the 10 men available? Now, if they're just going to a conference here, the order in which they're selected does not matter. Let's be clear on that piece. Order does not matter. Also, there's no repetition, of course. So two different men from the, from the set of 10 that are available. So I see this as perfectly combinations here. 10 different men, 10 distinct men, and I'm going to choose or group two of them. How many groupings of two from the set of 10 can I create? Okay. Now I have to do something separate, and I like that buzzword right in there, and now I also have to figure out how many ways to select the two women from the nine that are available. So let's go ahead and make a second little slot in our slot diagram, and let's do the same thing. I have a set of nine women that are available, and I'm going to group two of them at a time. How many different groupings of two women from the set of nine can we create? And so in this case, it says how many ways can management make its decision? It has to do both of these, this and this. How many ways can we choose the men and how many ways can we choose the women? So we've kind of seen this before where I multiply the number of tasks for, or multiply the number of possibilities for each task and that's exactly what I would do here. Um, you'll see this a lot with counting and um, when we do probability as well and typically means multiply or typically means add. And so in this case, it's definitely a fundamental counting principle in between the two. All right, well, let's go ahead and pull this off here. Um, I'm going to get both of those and then just multiply them together. So let's go 10 and let's go get that 10 C2, get 45. And then everyone, let's do 9 C2. And so 36, so this would be 45 times 36. And last, let's go ahead and get that. And we should get our final answer. So a nice hard one there. You can see a lot of overlap with some things we've talked about. A little counting principle kind of snuck in there because there were two different things to do. How many ways can I do one thing and how many ways can I do a second? and I multiply them together to get the total. Wow, very cool. All right, now, example five. Said a lot of it is interpretation. Just uh, make sure you've, you've really taken care of every condition and you've interpreted the wording correctly. Example five, a pizza restaurant offers a selection of 10 different toppings. How many different pizzas can be made? Ah, okay. Well, first order of business is, uh, well, let's, let's talk about a couple things, I guess, with this one. When we're talking about toppings on a pizza, I, I would argue that the order that they're placed does not matter. They're just all going to be on there together. So I would argue it's just a grouping of the toppings as opposed to an arrangement of the toppings. hope everyone's okay with that uh, interpretation. And then the second piece is it really doesn't say we have to select a certain number of toppings. So the way I'm seeing this, everyone, is we could have zero toppings, theoretically, or one topping, or two, or three, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is everyone okay with that piece? It just says it offers a selection of 10 different toppings. And in terms of ordering pizza, you can have no, one with no toppings, or one topping, or two, or three. 
et cetera, et cetera, right down the line. So let's make sure we clarify that piece. So this is the number of possible toppings when you order your pizza, anywhere from zero to 10. Now I had already kind of said, um, when we talk about counting and means multiply, there it was on the previous example, and or means addition. So I hope everyone's okay with the fact that we'll find the number of zero topping pizzas and add it to the number of one topping pizzas and add it to the number of two topping pizzas, et cetera, right down the line there. So in this case, I'm hoping, and we're going to go combinations on this, by the way, but this would be 10C0. So uh, 10 different toppings. And by the way, we'll kind of say the same thing where no repetition. If, if you order pepperoni, that's what you order. You don't order a double or anything like that. So selection of 10 different toppings. So in this case, how many ways can I do zero toppings? Well, I think we would probably get one on that. I think everyone would agree with that piece. And then 10C1. Okay, so 10C1, everybody. Uh, and by the way, you can kind of think about this logically. How many different ways from the set of 10 can we order one topping? Well, it could be any one of the 10. So I think 10C1 would be, um, would be 10. Cool, and then 10C2, 10C3, et cetera, et cetera. Guys, I'm going to put a little dot, dot, dot on that. And then maybe let's get a few and start going from there. I have a few written on my paper, so um, I'm going to go ahead and get a couple from the calculator and then write just some of the others from my paper. But just to get us thinking about it, so uh, in this case, what if you want to order two toppings? Well, you would throw two toppings on there from the group of ten, or set of 10, excuse me. Uh, so you would do 10C2, 10 toppings to choose from, and you're going to group two of them on your pizza. And there are 45 different ways you can do that. So 10C2 is 45. Now just to get this moving along here, 10C3 just happens to be 120. 10C4 happens to be uh, 210, I believe. There it is, 210. And then I have 252 for 10C5. 10C6 goes back to 210. 10C7 goes back to 120. 10C8, if you chose eight toppings, 45 different ways you can do that. 10C9 would be leaving one out. Ten ways you can leave one out. And last but not least, 10C10, everyone. You choose all the toppings, there's only one way you can pull that off. Now, by the way, as you're going to see on the next piece, there's a reason this one um, precedes our next little part to this notes worksheet. Do these numbers, at least the way they're kind of arranged, look familiar? They might. They might. They have a little symmetry to them. Uh, anyway, if we do add all those up, I have it on my paper, so I'm not going to bring up the calculator to do it, but I get 1,024. Excellent. So 1,024 different ways that you can uh, order a pizza. Good. All right, let's go get the last couple pieces here. So um, I think I had alluded to this before, but uh, there is a connection here with the numbers in Pascal's triangle to a particular operation. And it just so happens that the operation at hand that meets the, the numbers in Pascal's triangle is uh, the combinations formula. So it says draw Pascal's triangle, place the row numbers to the side, indicate the diagonals on the triangle beginning with diagonal zero, and we'll perform several calculations using the combinations formula. Okay. So how about this, everyone? Let's just run a few rows and ideas here. So if you don't mind, take the lead on this. And let's just go a few rows out. I'll go maybe one more here, and I think that should suffice. Something like that. And did you see, by the way, look at the numbers above in example five. Do they have that same kind of feel to it? What did we get? A 1, and then 10, and then 45, and then they kind of work backwards. So um, those numbers happen to be directly from Pascal's triangle. Now we've kind of talked about this before. This is row 0. I'm not going to write them in this, this case. We'll just kind of get moving on this piece. This is row 0. We've talked about that before. This is row 1. 
This is row 2, row 3, row 4, row 5, etc., etc. Now also, this would be diagonal 0, diagonal 1, diagonal 2, diagonal 3, etc., right down the line there. Hope everyone's okay with that. So if I was to pick a particular number here, I could figure out its placement, essentially. I could figure out what row it is, and I could also figure out what diagonal it is. Well, as it so happens, these numbers match up perfectly with Pascal's triangle, with the n value being the row, and the r value being the diagonal. So I'm going to go ahead and write a few things up over here, just right next to it. Let's see if I can do this successfully. But that top number is actually 0C0. Zero, zero objects grouping zero at a time. There's only one way you can do it. And then the next one would be 1C0 and 1C1. Next, let's go ahead and do this. One, oh, sorry, 2C0, 2C1, 2C2. That's what these three numbers right here would be. Next, let's go ahead and do this. I'll do maybe one or two more of these before I lose patience. So that would be 3C0, 3C1, 3C2, and 3C3. So if I was to do those combination values, you'd get 1, 3, 3, 1. Let me do one more. How about that? And then um, we'll go ahead and use the calculator to just confirm one of those. So here we go. How about this one? This would be 4C0, 4C1, 4C2, 4C3, and 4C4. Let's pick one. So I think I was circling this one before. Why don't I do that? So this one right here, everybody, is in row 5, and its diagonal would be 0, 1, 2. So this is row 5, diagonal 2. So this should be the same as 5C2. Row 5, diagonal 2. Well, let's go ahead and try that out. And you can see that the, the combinations calculation fits perfectly on the numbers in Pascal's triangle. So 5C2, and there's your 10. If I was to do 5C3, that's this, 5C4, etc., etc. So I'm just going to dot, dot, dot that piece right on down there, but you get a sense of what it looks like. So one way to kind of do this is if you're kind of working with combinations and you know Pascal's triangle pretty well, if you're asking yourself, hey, I don't know what 3C1 is, well, here it is. 3C1, row 3, diagonal 1 in Pascal's. Okay, let's just do the last piece. So we'd love for you to actually pause after I kind of read this and see if you can pull it off and then just uh, come on back. As I said, one of the hardest things about this unit is really deciding when the problem is a candidate for permutations or combinations, or do you just have to rely on the fundamental counting principle? Okay, so pause if you don't mind and, and try it out. Well, let's see how you did. Letter A, you're given a list of 10 books to read. You are to select four to read during the semester. How many different selections are there? Now, it doesn't say anything about the order matters or anything like that. I guess we can interpret one way or the other. But again, just a buzzword, selections, uh, how many ways can you choose, how many groups. It doesn't say anything about the order matters. And so you're just going to select four books to read out of a set of ten. And so this would be combinations. Ten distinct objects, and you're going to read four of them during the semester. Okay. Four students asked to meet with the principal, and how many ways can the time slots be assigned? In this case, I have four students. I'm going to arrange four of them into the four time slots, and so this seems to be a 4P4. So a set of four students, and I'm going to arrange four of them at a time. No, um, no permit. I'm sorry, no um, repetition or anything like that. So this is permutations. And let us see, there are five true false questions. How many ways can these five problems be answered? In this case, we're not taking five questions and arranging them or grouping them or anything like that. It's literally just how many ways can I answer the first question? How many ways can I answer the second question? It's not arranging or grouping 
um, a subset of objects from a distinct set. So I see this as the fundamental counting principle. All right. Well, you know, if you have some questions with this, obviously, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, there, it can be quite difficult to interpret, but get the practice on this and, and really work through as best as possible and just make that decision. Permutations, combinations, counting principle, and then go from there. So let me know how I can help you with that. Thanks for listening, of course.